Now I need your assistance this morning a little bit, so I'll start with the ladies. You're going to shout out a word. We're going to learn a Greek lesson today. You're going to shout out the word eleison, as in Kyrie eleison, that's in our service. Eleison. All right, ladies, let's go try it. Eleison. Excellent. One more time. Eleison. All right, gentlemen, you are going to shout out the word apolison. All right, let's try that. Apolison. With more conviction. Apolison. Thank you very much. Hang on to those two words. We'll get back to those in a minute. I am puzzled by this gospel story. This is not the Jesus I learned about in Sunday school. I don't know what got into him this morning, but something is different. I mean, we just, we just read, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, God is gathering the outcasts of Israel. And then we have this picture of Jesus. And the story, I think, focuses us on a question of boundaries and faith. And where do those two come together? Jesus enters a situation where apparently his own assumptions are tested. He leaves the mostly Jewish side of the Galilee in Gennesaret to go into Gentile country. His time there reveals this remarkable story of faith in what is a very unexpected place. <clears throat> But this is an unexpected Jesus also. This is not at first what we expect from him. This woman, he seems less eager to help than anyone else in the entire set of Gospels. I've never seen him less willing to help someone. And he explains that it's not his mission. This is not his problem. He was sent to the house of Israel. Except that it's Jesus who has left his own country and gone into a foreign place. He has gone into this woman's territory. So I'm not sure what he was expecting to find. What's more puzzling is that she demonstrates that she has a better grasp of Jesus' identity than his hand-selected disciples do at this point in the narrative. Jesus' encounter with her unsettles boundaries. It unsettles boundaries and it questions definitions of clean and unclean, who is worthy and who is not, who is in and who is out. And her, his response to her is perplexing. At first, he says nothing. But he doesn't send her away either. And only after she is persistent and passionate does he talk to her at all. He tells the disciples, his mission is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when he speaks to her, well, my mother would have said he was, quite frankly, rude and insulting. The disciples also seem to think that Jesus should stay focused on the needs of Israel. They keep telling him to send her away because they're tired of hearing her cries for help. And here's where you come in. One scholar points out that what has been lost in our English translation is a solo and a chorus that Matthew has set up with the woman on one side and the disciples against her. She is a foreigner. This Canaanite woman, however, uses all the appropriate language of a true Israelite. 
In Greek, she persistently cries out for God's mercy. Kyrie eleison. And we are meant to remember, and so is Matthew's audience, we are meant to remember that Kyrie eleison is in our own liturgy. On the other side, her pleas are matched by the shouting of the disciples, send her away, get rid of her. And the two Greek words are a sort of rhyming, bitter echo of the woman's cry. It's like something out of West Side Story. With someone over here pleading and the gang over here talking them down. So are you ready? So we're going to do twice through. Ladies, men, ladies, men. All right? Are you ready? Ladies? Apostle. Oh, more passion. Apostle. That's what we've got going on in this story. They're shouting her down. And she is more fervently crying for help. she's a foreigner. She worships false gods. She's a Gentile, and excuse me ladies, she's a woman. That's three strikes against her. She is, by Jewish tradition, she is supposed to be kept two arms distance away from Jesus as a pious Jewish rabbi. She's got nothing in her favor. But then comes this focus of the story, this astounding and persistent faith that stands her ground against all opposition. She will not be put off. She may be rejected, she may feel hopeless, but she requests Jesus' help even if it is only the meager crumbs that might fall from the table. And yet, in the opening which precedes the story, Jesus has just responded to the Pharisees. And he's reframing the boundaries of clean and unclean. His disciples have been chastised for not washing their hands before they eat. And the Pharisees are apoplectic about this. And Jesus says, you've got it all wrong. It's the content of a character that matters. And in this woman, it's not the quality of her religion. It's the quality of her love, I think, that gets Jesus' attention. Is it possible that the disciples, and it seems that Peter doesn't understand, that the disciples don't agree with Jesus about this? They think he's on the wrong course. If so, then this whole scene may be a way for him to call them out, to say out loud what they are thinking. She should go away. But then her persistent faith allows Jesus to show courageous compassion that sweeps away everything that they are thinking. And we should not miss the parallel of a couple of weeks ago when the disciples also wanted to send the crowd away because they believe they cannot possibly feed them. Is this possibly another boundary between scarcity and abundance? Last time it was about food, this time it is about compassion? What is going on here? Has Jesus succumbed to his own cultural prejudices? Is he worn out with frayed nerves and so he snaps at this woman? Did he make a mistake? Does he change his mind? Or is this an object lesson for all who witnessed what he did of that sense of radical welcome and abundance by God? for all who come seeking help. 
Is Jesus the one who is caught up short, or is it, once more, the disciples who get their comeuppance? Who learn that sending the crowd away, sending this woman away, is not what we are to do. We know that Matthew's community, a mostly Jewish Christian community, was lots of Gentiles were being attracted by how they lived. And I'll bet that made his Jewish community really nervous. It may well be that Matthew is trying to teach his community why they go out and take the gospel to the Gentiles. And the woman's words and her crossing of Jesus' boundaries reminds Matthew's church that God is constantly entering new territory and God is constantly breaking the boundaries we think are there. This is God who has that unsettling quality of meeting outsiders and then granting them not just a crumb, but a place at the table. Maybe one of the things we learn from this story is how hard it really is to do the right thing sometimes. So what in the world does this have to do with Hickory Neck today? Well, I think this is your time of crossing a boundary. You are crossing over from the boundary of being settled and comfortable and ready to go into the future to being unsettled with lots of questions. You have crossed a boundary into the unfamiliar. And Episcopalians don't like to have things unfamiliar. <laughs> But in fact, this is a valuable time because it's a time when you have the opportunity to remember and recommit to your core values as a church. Where you may learn to seek not only the rector you think you want, but maybe the one that you need, or if you prefer, the one that God wants to show you. This boundary between where you are and where we're going is, most in, is one of the most important ones to cross and perhaps the most difficult because we like our routine and we like our predictable church life. We like our church to be stable in a difficult and bewildering world. You are fortunate because you'll have Father Henry who will be a part of that continuity. Not every church that's looking for someone has someone already there who can help hold things together, but you have that blessing. So what is best for us, we may ask? What, what do we need to do to grow as a people? As your vestry prepares for this discernment and this search, they will choose a discernment committee. They will choose an interim priest who will come and help to manage this transition. And then as the discernment committee begins to ask and hear about the needs and desires of this congregation, what you hope for, what you expect, always remember that crossing this boundary between where you are or where you've been, let's say, and where you're going, is not a large physical boundary, but it can be a very large emotional and spiritual boundary. Something else you can probably expect to see are the comings and goings of people in the congregation. There may be some who will stay on the edges for a while to see what will come next. Some may leave. Some others may return. All the while, new people will come among you and they will be unaware of this transition. They will, know, they will not know how it's always been. 
Your task is to be open to all of those different people because they will each have different needs according to how they are experiencing this new territory. It's a challenge, but it's also how the transition time helps to reset things, to allow the spirit to, be, to open us into new directions, to allow for new leadership, new ideas, and a new start. Being patient, being prayerful, not only with yourselves, but those who are coming and going, will also keep the boundaries of your hospitality. Now what's true is that every church has its challenge during this time. So the job of that interim priest, the job of your vestry, the job of the bishop's office, is to help identify things that need to be discerned and addressed before a new rector arrives. And then they'll later there'll be other things that will be made a part of mutual expectations that are negotiated for the future. But there are always questions, there are always some fears before this takes place. That we will find someone who is right for us, or the fear that we might lose momentum during the, the search, or that there could be conflict. We want to know that we're going to be all right, that maybe we'll even grow, that we will move ahead. And dare I say it, what if there are changes that need to be, hap that need to be happening? For Episcopalians, change is a four-letter word. We know that. <laughs> and yes, while some churches have seen disagreements or rumor or impatience during this time, they have also experienced renewal and discovery. They have experienced a refocusing and a remembering. All of this is towards writing a new chapter of your story. And so even though there will be anxieties, it is good also to focus on what you have, to focus on how God is already blessing you, rather than just focusing on what you think you lack. A time of transition like yours is full of decisions and questions. And so the diocese uses a process that is updated and tested and it is flexible but it lays out a foundation that builds step by step so that everybody, the congregation, the vestry, the search committee, your staff, your lay leadership, everybody has what they need during this time. I'll be talking about that in more detail at 10 o'clock. This is a time to reevaluate both your needs and your gifts, to renew your sense of unity, to look forward with hope even while you see your lives changing. Not unlike this woman, this Canaanite woman, this is a time for both courage and faithfulness, trusting God to lead you forward into the future that he hopes for you. Amen.